Methods does it take Jet, to tech. fix a mic? That's what we're doing this time. All right. I'm not too good with tech. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for that beautiful start, Sharon. That was just lovely. And, uh, <clears throat> and we'd actually like to ask everybody to, uh, Sharon's been nice enough to put the hymn numbers when she plays. So open up your hymnals and follow along with the words so we can really soak in this beautiful music. So. I would like to welcome everybody here this morning and online. I'm Keith McRae, uh, and uh, and just uh, just welcome you here. I, uh, you know, we have a big week in front of us here in the United States, don't we? And I, I don't know how how you're all feeling about it. I'm just really having a hard time, and uh, I, uh, it's not like this is the first election I've ever heard about, but uh, there's something about this that has brought about just visceral feelings in me that I uh, have not encountered before. I've, I've had my feelings with, about those kinds of things. I used to play some sports and play some rugby, and when somebody took a cheap shot, I took a number, but I always weighed 40 pounds less than everybody else, so I couldn't do anything anyway. But, uh, but when I see just this hatred and injustice, and it just makes me angry, and I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't be angry, and how do I? I just listened to a uh, podcast this morning in the gym all about, it was on uh, The Daily, and it was all about Springfield, and supposedly, and, and primarily the family whose, whose son was killed. Anyway, but just all the hatred and, and so forth, and it just, it just really, so how do we deal with this? I'm hoping Chip will tell me how to do that today and, and fix that problem for me, because uh, it's been a problem for a long time. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, what I try to remember during these times is that, you know, whoever gets, we'll, we'll probably have, maybe we'll have a new president on Wednesday, and maybe we won't, um, but, uh, uh, you know, this is just the president of the United States, right? It's just a, it, it's, it's really just an earthly position. And for all the power we hear about, their power is nothing. Their power is a drop in the ocean compared to God. God will, God will control our fate. God will, just, God will judge us at some point. And despite what we hear from televangelists on selling books on television, I don't think either one of these political candidates was sent down from heaven to fix everything. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. But uh, 
Anyway, uh, I just try to think about this. It, it, it seems to help. I, I, hope, I hope Chip will, will give me some other coping strategies. No but, uh, but anyway, um, with that said, let's go to the call to worship. And Af will stand for this, please. And uh, for those who are able, please remain standing. Um, and we will sing hymns, hymn 61 afterwards. Loving Lord, when we wander to distant places, you watch the road to greet us when we finally come home. You may be seated. If I haven't met you, I'm Terry McHugh, part of the pastoral team, and as we gather to worship, it's good to be together. Uh, it's good to be together in person. It's good to be together with those of you online, and this is a time in our service where we lift up our prayers to God. It's an opportunity to share celebrations and ways that we can pray, and Keith has already lifted up something that's on a lot of our minds is uh, this coming election and all that's going on with that, and we continue to pray for the hurricane, uh, those affected by the hurricanes. Um, in recent weeks, but um, we invite you to share ways that we can pray for you or in a situation. Craig McGuy has a microphone so everybody can hear online and in person, and we just ask that you would raise your hand and then let us know your name and how we can pray. And if you're worshiping online or in person, we, you can always email just prayer at garfieldchurch.org and uh, whatever it is will be lifted up by our house of prayer and others. So how can we pray today? We'll try it again. God is good. The mic works. I think Brian has a weather forecast for us. Well, good morning, Garfield Memorial. Typically, you guys see me up in the front singing with the choir. But today, I would just like to shed a little light on Let There Be Light. So... If y'all don't mind, if you look in your bulletins, we have a couple of projects that we're going to be committing to this uh, winter season. Child of the Light offering.
That's going to be one of our biggest ones that we've got right now. Obviously, we're looking for 224 million and, or 1,024. Uh, yes, 224 million. Yes. We, are, we are aiming for a million. It's the Lord's work. <laughs> but absolutely so. We're looking to do a couple of projects. And we just want to get everything started off of our homeless project. So just putting it out there. I don't know if you guys woke up this morning and, you know, saw a little frost on your windows or if you maybe saw a little, you know, dew on the grass, but you can tell, or if you're wearing a jacket today, it's just getting a little bit colder out there. So we do want to hit this off. We want to just, you know, get the ball started. Uh, anything helps, of course, but we just want to, you know, get our project started off the right way here at Garfield Memorial. So thank you guys. All right, let there be light. Hello, um, my name is Mary Pat Wiegand, and I just wanted to ask for prayers for all um, families and children. Uh, November is Early Childhood Mental Health Awareness Month. Oftentimes, we as adults get very caught up in what's going on in our lives, and I'm um, just asking that we pray for the little people in our lives and that the interventions they need are um, supported. So prayers for those children and their families that are having um, mental and behavioral health issues to overcome. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Steve. Uh, two things. One, I'd like to thank everybody again for all the prayer that you've given my family and relatives and people that come through our house in need. Uh, your prayers have worked magnificently. My wife can now see better than she has in 30 years, and she was um, some years back legally blind, so uh, we're very grateful of that. And the second thing is, uh, in terms of this um, uh, political event that's coming up, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about, don't worry about that. Don't concentrate on that. Reach out to the Holy Spirit and ask for direction on whatever is coming and he will be there for you if you can open up to him. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Constant, and I just want to say thank you to the church uh, for folks reaching out, calling, sending cards, checking in on, on my husband, Chris, and also my dad. Chris is home and is getting stronger, and he's going to be going back to work soon, so yay God for that. Um, and dad still is in need of prayer. He's got a long road ahead, but we're managing. Uh, but mostly thank you for everyone because you all have been so kind and so loving. Um, and it's just nice to know that you've got so, much, so many people praying for you and holding you and uplifting you. And if I did not respond to your message, I'm sorry. I <laughs> promise I didn't overlook you. It was definitely spelt, felt. Thank you. Good to see the body of Christ in action. Let's turn to God. Lord, we've lifted up some things out loud and some things in our heart and some things we don't even know how to pray or what to pray, but the good news is that you do. So by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, reach deep inside of us and discover those needs and desires and continue to help us to be more and more like you, that as we live uh, and love one another, it's because you loved us first. So we thank you that you are the God who is with us. And we're, as we near the Christmas season and Advent, a reminder of that you came in the flesh to be with us. You loved us so much, uh, Lord, that you sent your only son. So as we travel through whatever we're traveling through in our personal lives and as a community and as a nation and as a world, you are with us. And you are the one who brings the light. So. We echo, let there be light in all aspects of our lives and every corner that we find ourselves in. Help us to be beacons. We can only do it with you, Lord. We don't have the power ourselves. In fact, we're powerless and we're broken. So as we prepare today to come to your table in just a little while, cleanse us, open our hearts, and may we be truly transformed by the bread of life that you offer to us. 
And let's us join our voices together in the prayer that you model for us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our kingdom come, our will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's a time in our worship we call the offering. The truth is, all of the worship service is an offering, and all of our lives are really an offering. But this is a dedicated time where we offer back to God some of the resources that he's blessed us with. We know everybody can't give to the same capacity, but every gift counts. Every gift helps to move the mission to widen the circle, to connect diverse people who share a common brokenness with Jesus. So thank you for all that you give. Um, if you're, It's easy to give online, whether you're here in person um, or worshiping online. You can go to uh, garfieldchurch.org slash giving. And also, if you're here in person, the information is in your bullets on how to give digitally in multiple ways. And uh, just know that we really appreciate all that you sacrifice and all that you give, not only in financial resources, but in service. If you're new here at Garfield, we would, we are glad you're here. We invite you to go to new at gmc.org. It's all spelled out. We have a fun survey and a surprise for you um, afterwards. And more than that, we'll connect you with our weekly e-notes from the pastors and be able to connect with you a little bit more beyond this time of worship. So we hope you'll go to new at gmc.org and fill out our fun little survey. We, have, we want to lift up, we have some upcoming Friendsgiving celebrations during, as we launched the year, we had a series called Bless, and each letter in Bless stood for something, and the E stood for eating together. So as we're approaching the Thanksgiving and looking towards the holiday season, um, we have several groups and families that are opening their homes, their spaces, to invite you to enjoy a Friendsgiving meal. Most of them would be potlucks. But you can sign up if you go to uh, garfieldchurch.org on the homepage. There's an events button. You click on that, and you can sign up for whatever date and time works for you. We have um, November 10th uh, at a home in Woodmere, November 11th, the men's group um, and there's, is hosting one, and they're especially inviting veterans to celebrate and honor you. November 17th, the Moms Giving uh, celebration will happen with our Moms group. November 18th, the Millennial Monday will have a Friendsgiving. Uh, November 21st, the women's group will have one. 11, 23rd, one at a home in Pepper Pike. And then November 25th, um, 7 o'clock at a home in Chagrin Falls. So we, we hope to take advantage of that to build community, build connections, get to know people from Garfield that you may not have met um, and be able to eat together and celebrate together and share together. So we hope you'll sign up for that. Next Sunday is another Soup Sunday. We're doing these on the second Sunday. This is our youth group, but for November and December and October, the proceeds from the soup sales are going towards the uh, Let There Be Light offering. So we appreciate that. But we really need people to make soup. It can't just be me and Pastor Chip, even though I make the best soup always. <laughs> But I want some competition besides him. Now, seriously, if you're willing to make a crock pot or a pot of soup and bring it in, uh, the, the youth will portion it out. And then we just appreciate the support. And it's, it's a lot of fun. So we hope you'll be part of that. So let's continue to worship God by the giving of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. <laughs>
Lord, we thank you for your incredible generosity towards us and offer these gifts and tithes and offerings as a token of our love and gratitude uh, for your love and your grace and your mercy. Help us to be vessels of peace in these times. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's Bible reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 14, and you can follow along on the back of your bulletin if you wish. Welcome the person who is weak in faith, but not in order to argue about differences of opinion. One person believes in eating everything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Those who eat must not look down on the ones who don't, and the ones who don't eat must not judge the ones who do because God has accepted them. One person considers some days to be more sacred than others, while another person considers all days to be the same. Each person must have their own convictions. But why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you look down on your brother or sister? We all will stand in front of the judgment seat of God. So let's strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. Amen. Thank you. 
Aaron, thank you so much. As you were playing, I, I had a few thoughts. May we worship God as aggressively and as passionately as you play. May we attack injustice the way you attack those teams. And may all of that then lift up a praise to heaven with from all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our minds. And if we do that, maybe just maybe the kingdom will inch a little closer. Thank you for that. Um, you roused my soul. And I needed that because my good friend and our lay leader, Keith McCray, at the beginning of the service said, I have to solve <laughs> all the tension and crisis around this election. And I got to do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm not preaching about the election today. My title is, and this is a standalone message. We're going to go into a new series next week. My message, the title of it, if you've seen it, is Romans and Republicans and Democrats. And I'm not preaching about the election. I'm not a political partisan. I'm a preacher of the gospel. But Karl Barth, who's arguably the greatest theologian of the modern time, had a word to preachers. He said, preachers always ought to have the Bible in one hand and their tablet in the other. Actually, he said the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. But only a third of the folks that worship here today will know what a newspaper is. So I had to put that in contemporary language. But what he's saying is to be grounded in God's word and to look out into the world and to bring God's word, the good news, upon the news of the world. It's, it's called description and prescription. Go and to look into the word of God that describes what's broken in us and, and all, describes the cure for that brokenness and then go out and try to prescribe to the world some, uh, some, some prescriptions for uh, the disunity, the brokenness that we see. And that's what I'm trying to do this moment. We, we know, as we said, we're in a time of great division. Um, we've descended into division. And division has its costs, right? If, if Satan was a, were, were a math teacher, he would focus on division and subtraction. But if Jesus was a math teacher, he would focus on addition and multiplication, adding to the family of God, multiplying loaves to feed the hungry of the world. And when we descend into division, bad things happen. Uh, looking into my tablet, looking into the news, which I always pay attention to, I, I had a parable for that. On August 28th, just before we went into fall this year, in uh, Colorado at the San Isabel National Forest, 15 executives of a company went out for a hike as part of a team building uh, project. And as, as they were to some to ascend to the summit of a, of a mountain, others to go to various stations, one got cut off from the, from the fold. They were in small groups, and one lost his way from the fold and continued on up to the summit. And when everyone else had done their job, the other 14, not knowing they had left one behind, began to descend. And when they descended, what they, what they did was they pulled up all the markers that were left on how to get back home. And when the one at the top of the mountain began to try to find his way there was no way, there were no guide marks, there were no signposts, and he wandered and fell again and again and again and was stuck there for 36 hours until someone happened upon him at a drainage ditch. And I thought that's what division does. It, it, it leaves people behind, especially our children, especially others who see us misbehave and they, they're trying to get to the summit and, and, and then they look around and there's no markers guiding them on how to get home. So what's the prescription? I, I turn to Paul's writing in Romans. Romans is Paul's masterpiece. One New Testament scholar called it the most complicated, in-depth, theological, and influential letter of the New Testament. It is. And, and Paul has a lot to teach us because Paul wasn't always Paul. Paul was Saul, and, and Saul was the great divider of the ancient world. Nobody divided people like Saul did. Saul the Pharisee, he knew everything. He was a, you know, we're worried about Christian nationalism. Paul was a Jewish nationalist. Anybody that didn't behave the way he thought they ought to behave uh, uh, couldn't get into the kingdom of God. They were to be tortured. They were to be cast out. He was an absolute racist and bigot. He 
hated Gentiles. He hated Samaritans. He thought the world should be done with them. He was a misogynist. He, he thought women were third rate. In fact, as a Pharisee, every day he would get up in the morning and pray, God, I thank you that you did not make me a woman. He was, he was horrible, and he preached violence against everyone who didn't agree with him. And he killed those ultimately who didn't, some of those being Christians. In fact, the first the Christian martyr, Stephen, if you read Acts 6, it said Saul stirred up the crowd and gladly held their coats so they could do that torturous act. But, but Paul, Saul met Jesus, and Jesus says when you do this to others, when you harm others, when you use hateful rhetoric to others, you're doing it to me. And, and Paul said, I don't even know you. And Jesus said, I, I'm, I'm your savior too. And, and Saul, scales fell from his eyes and violence fell from his ways. And he got up and after 13 years of reflection, he went out and began to minister the gospel. And, and Paul was speaking to a problem in the church. Every letter that that's Paul wrote was a, was a solution to a problem except for Philippians. Philippians is the only letter he doesn't condemn. He just encourages. But every one was about division. That was the problem in the church, division. You know, we, 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 can you imagine that, Christians being divided? Just hard to imagine that could ever happen, right? Divisions in the church. Um, I, I really do want to compliment you all. I hope you don't receive this as a rebuke. Just a reminder. Um, honey, could you grab my water? I don't want to come down there. People will think I'm going somewhere I should have brought with me. But really, I, I, you know, in 2016 and, and 2020 during those election seasons, I could barely, thank you, sweetheart, I could barely preach a sermon, write an e-note, or post anything online that I didn't get scrutinized or looked back and forth. And uh, there hasn't been any of that this year. I, we haven't lost any members that I know of. But I would know if because when members are, are upset and they don't they don't leave quiet, they leave loud, right? So we haven't had any of that. So you all are doing this kind of work, and I and I want to applaud you for that to, in the midst of our diversity to model for our world that there is a way in Christ. Satan, I rebuke you for trying to take my voice. All right. So what, what's going on in the Roman church? The Roman church was extremely divided by two parties, conservative and liberal, sound familiar? Um, the conservative party were the Jewish Christians. They had come into the faith out of Judaism. The kind of liberal party, progressive party, they were the Gentile Christians. They were new to faith. They, were, they weren't burdened or encumbered by old ways. And, and they came in with so many different ideas and thoughts and all of a sudden, there was this big tension in the church. You read it in every one, 1 Corinthians, if you read it. Paul says, I've heard about quarrels. And that's why he writes 1 Corinthians 13 about love. He wasn't writing about a Christian marriage, although it's fine to read him it there. He was writing about division and the cure for it. And so what's going on in this passage? Some weird things, right? Let me tell you some of the divisions Paul's speaking to and how we can you know, descend into minors things. First off, there was the division I call to meet or not to meet. Did you hear that about meat and vegetables? I mean, what's going on here? Is this like a keto diet versus vegan? Um, <laughs> is this like PETA, you know, kind of protecting the animal? No, in the ancient world, they would kill and eat a cow as easily as they'd pick an olive from the tree. What was happening is in the center of Rome, this wasn't Jerusalem, when in, in Judaism, when they brought forth an animal to sacrifice, they would burn the whole animal. They would give the sacrifice to Yahweh in, in honor of God. But in Rome, in the pagan temples, they would, they would bring a sacrifice of an animal. They would cut out and give the pagan god their choice meats, and then they would take the rest of the meat and go take it to market. And the Jewish Christians said, we can't eat that meat that's been taken to a pagan temple. And so all they ate was vegetables. Now, and this has happened before. If you read Daniel, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did that in Persia. Well, the Gentile Christians go, well, that's silly. The pagan gods aren't gods at all. They're nothing. They're vapor. They're vacuum. Jesus is Lord. So we can eat whatever we want. And, 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 and Paul uh, says to them, you know, um, 
Those who eat must not look down on the ones who don't and must not judge because God has accepted them all. And, and, and so, you know, the Gentiles thought that was silly. See, the, Jew, the Jewish Christians kind of felt they were elevated over the Gentile Christians because they were adhering to tradition. And the Gentile Christians thought that they were elevated over the Jewish Christians because they were free. And this is just silly practice. We haven't heard anything like that, right? The second division they had was the high holy days. Do you hear that? One per person considers some days to be more sacred than others, while another per person considers all days to be the same. Each person, Paul says, must have their own convictions and do everything in honor of the Lord. What was this all about? Well, the Jewish Christians, they came out of uh, Judaism where there were a lot of festivals. You read about those, right? Jesus went to the festivals, festivals of booths. Every time I say that, I have to say booths because people think I'm saying festival of booths. No, <laughs> it's festival of booths, right? Um, I always think of my... my uh, my cousin Vinny, did you say you? No, you know, um, <laughs> booze, right? And the festival of lights, they had all these things. And they were great times. And they honored those traditions. And they would get together and they would celebrate. And, and, and they would look down on people who didn't. And the Gentiles were like, these are, it's fine, you want to go do that. But they, they said, we, we, don't, we, we don't ascribe to that. And, 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 you know, and, and we read this. And if you go down to verse 21 in Romans, we didn't read. They had the same problem about drinking wine because it was offered at the pagan temples. And this was the stuff that ended up when you descend into division. We want to kind of snicker at this, don't you? But they weren't really minor issues to them. God help us. I hope future generations snicker at us too. The more we argue and quarrel, the further we move away from one another. Do you ever notice that? The further we move away. I love the old story. It's kind of corny, but there was a man who was rescued on a desert island. He'd been alone, kind of like Tom Cruise in that FedEx commercial that ran for two hours and 30 minutes um, a while back. And he was on a desert island, and he was rescued. And he had built a village, right? And there were two big buildings, one at the left of the village, one at the right. And when they rescued him, they said, what are those? He said, well, those are my churches. He said, well, why do you have two? You're all by yourself. He said, well, that one's my church, and that's one, the one I used to go to. See, when, <laughs> when we quarrel, we divide. I, I, I've been reading uh, Robert Putman again. I looked at this. He wrote in 1920. He, maybe you know his book, Bowling Together. He's a Harvard research professor, and he, he looks at how the community has broken down and how can we restore it. But this book, he was called The Upswing, and it's how America came together a century ago and how we can do it again. And what Putman says is, when he looked in 2020, and people said, well, I can't believe we're so divided. He said, it was that way before. We were right here before in 1880, where everything was rugged individualism, you know, social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's all about you and what you can attain and achieve. And that's, that was the, the mindset after the Civil War in 1880. And, and this is this little graph. I've got, I've got slides of it. I've got a couple in your bulletin. But, but this is a graph. He calls it the I, we, I curve. And, and this is where we're on individualism. In, in the 60s and 70s, we got up. This is where we were on community and collectivism. And then in the 1980s, we began to descend back into I, me, and my, and we got right back to where we were before. And what Putnam noticed as a scholar is that even he would study the language, he would study, you know, newspapers, don't tell anybody, uh, you know, books, political speeches, everything else. And in the 1880s, he said every pronoun was I, me, and my. Do you notice how Jesus works against that? We pray the Lord's Prayer, right? It's not the only prayer. It was a blueprint for prayer. Do you ever notice there's no I, me, or mine in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, our sin. It's all collective, right? And he, Putman noticed as a researcher that as the community began to come together, the language changed. And in speeches and in, in books and in uh, media, it went from I, me, my to we, us, and our. And in the 1980s, it began to go back 
to I, me, and I. This guy is just a, a researcher. And if you notice those little two slides I have beneath the, the scripture, I've got two of them there. Um, this was a few research had done this, and they were looking at like from 1994 to 2017. If you look at that, on the left, this is where people fell on the spectrum. The red are Republicans, the blue are Democrats, the, the gray is the collective whole. And you've got extreme to the right and extreme to the left. But the medium, look at where the medium was between the two groups. Those are those little spikes. You see how close they are? They're right in there. By, by 2017, the next slide, look how far away they've gotten from each other. And look how that little mountain of gray has shrunk. Right? We're descending back into it's about me and my preferences and my needs, right? And, and so what does Paul say? I love this. Verse 19. Take the scripture home today and, and think about it this week. And he says, so let us do what? Let us. Let us. Let us. Not me. Let us strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. Right? Strive for those things. Strive to build up. And what does Paul do? Gosh, I have five points. I've got to do this in five minutes. John Gorman's down here going, I love it. Um, but yeah, because when I said I make a 35 minute sermon to feel like 34, I'm going to take a 25 minute sermon and make it feel like 35. Um, <laughs> five points. First, Paul, when he, this is Paul's prescription about the division in Romans 14, but it takes him 13 chapters to get there. Why? Because he's grounding us in the gospel. He's grounding us. He says, you famously, I've heard this at revival sermons, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who has faith. You've heard that, right? A million times I've heard it at revival. It, that's not the whole verse. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who has faith to the Jew and to the Gentile. He said the, the grounding of our division is to put God first. And to get Jesus back in his proper place, it is always Jesus first. America first. I know it's a political slogan. I get it. But it's really bad theology. Not America first. Jesus first. The kingdom of God first. Not Republican first. Not Democrat first. But God first. If we can do that, We've got the foundation to do what Paul says in Romans 12, to not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. That's the grounding of it. And then as we go into 14, here's his prescription. If you're grounded in this, you can do these four things. But he, he starts off with Romans 14.1. I love how Eugene Peterson uh, paraphrases that verse in the message translation. He says, Paul is saying this, welcome with open arms, those fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong in opinions, but weak in faith. Remember, they have their own history to keep with. Treat them gently. So how do we do that? Very quick, Paul's prescription, do not judge. He says it three times in this series. Do not judge must not look down on. Stop judging. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. The word judge in the Greek is a word krino, which means to evaluate, scrutinize, prefer one thing over another. All of us have our preferences. All of us scrutinize. All of us evaluate. We make moral decisions. That's great, Paul says. Just don't do it to one another. Right? As Jesus said, do not judge. Don't take the law, I mean, take the log out of your own eye. Instead of getting your magnifying glass and tweezers to take out the splinter in your neighbor's eye. Don't judge. Second thing, don't become a stumbling block. What he says is stop judging each other. This is verse 13, 15. Stop judging each other and never put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother and sister. For if you do that, you're no longer walking in love. Don't let your food, fill in the blank, whatever your issue is. For them, it was food. Don't let your food destroy someone else. Christ died for too. My wife has said that since we went into ministry. She would pray the prayer all the time. Oh, God, 
Don't let Chip or I, as we do ministry, stumble anybody. Don't, don't let us deviate them. My, my uh, spiritual mentor when I went to ministry, you know, you're on fire when you enter ministry. You know, um, then 34 years later, you look like me. Um, you know, but you're out there and you're ready to take on the world and leap tall buildings. And I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, Chip, I know you're passionate. I know you want to save the world and preach the gospel all at once. He said to me, remember ministries like shoveling snow. He said, I know you're eager, you're on fire, but don't go out so aggressively shoveling snow and so only seeing your way, only to find out that you've thrown all of your snow on your neighbor's driveway. And he said this to me, I wrote in my journal, I'll never forget this. He said, you can be so focused on clearing your own path that you end up making it impossible for your neighbors to walk down there. So don't judge and don't be a stumbling block and don't convict yourself, he says. He said people are blessed who don't convince themselves by the things they approve or disapprove. See, sometimes we make ourselves guilty by the opinions that we hold, not for holding the opinion, but for the way we held the opinion. Jesus never says go be right all the time. But he does say go love your neighbor all the time. <laughs> don't hold an opinion in such a way that you push people away from God and away from others and away from you. So don't convict yourself. Don't judge. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't convict yourself. And how many of you watch uh, The World's Most Interesting Man? Right? He drinks Tosaki. Have you seen him? What's his slogan? Stay thirsty, my friends, right? Here's what Paul's saying. Stay humble, my friends. Be immersed in humility. He starts off in his scripture is saying this. There is no, this is Romans 3, there's no one who is righteous, not even one, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let me tell you, every single Republican has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single Democrat has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we know that, when you do these things, then, verse 19, we can strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. You know what's very interesting about this work by Robert Putman and all the work he's done about community? You know what he said was one of the major factors that brought people together so that even in the 60s, we could eradicate apartheid from our country? You know what he said the catalyst was? It was the church. I mean, this is not Desmond Tutu. This is a Harvard research person. And he's telling us, guys, you can do something about this. I love it when he, when he says, Paul says strive. That word in the Greek is adonizomai. Don't try to say that at home. It's a verb that means this, to contend with adversaries, to enter a contest, to struggle with dangers and difficulties. Paul's telling us strive for the beloved community. Contend with anything that goes against it. And remember, we battle not only with flesh and blood, but with spiritual forces in high places. If not us, then who? And that's why I thank you for being the witness that you are willing to be a diverse church. Most aren't, because we prefer to, you know, that's the church I used to go to. This is the one I go to now. Birds of a feather to flock together. It's our job to model it, of building up. Let me close with this, and I'll probably have to run down the hall during communion, but you all stay. When I moved to Orange, uh, at Pepper Pike here, to be pastor 30 years ago, um, my sons were kind of taken out of school, and uh, I had to train a new superintendent, so I wasn't arriving here until September 26th. But my sons, who were going into fourth and seventh grade, we're in school, and school started like a month earlier. And so the denomination said, I said, look, I don't want my kids to come into a new school month in the year. So they paid for temporary housing, and Terry and the kids came up here while I stayed down in Mansfield. But my kids got involved with things, and so that they could meet new friends. Matthew ran for student government. Perry, Mr. Athlete, he went out and played football. He hadn't played football before. Um, he played, he, he was four-year golf and four-year basketball and golf and football run simultaneously, but there was no junior high golf. 
And he said, Dad, I want to go play football. Great, go. And uh, he went, and um, his first game was uh, at Perry High School. Uh, Perry playing at Perry High School. I didn't, I don't think I knew about Perry, but they had a nuclear power plant. But Terry had to be with something Matthew. So I drove up from Mansfield to be at his first game. And uh, he, he was at the game, and, and all the, I was sitting with the Orange fans. He went to Orange High School down the road, and, and the Orange fans were saying, go, Richard, you know, go, Jake, go. There. And I said, I yelled, go, Perry. <laughs> <laughs> Got a few looks. And then pretty soon, somebody said, you know, go, John, go, George, go, Perry. Finally, one woman said, are you in the wrong seats? I said, no, my son is Perry. And it was so funny. Perry was really fast. He didn't know a thing about football. But he and his bike, Perry would take one step, get behind the receiver. They'd just flip over his head, and Perry would just sprint 80 yards for a touchdown. And when he did that, everybody, everybody on our side said, go Perry, go Perry. Now the Perry fans on the other side heard us. And so they got a little mad. And so when they marched down the field for a touchdown, they kind of chanted back, go Perry, go Perry. And then per next time Perry got another touchdown. And we're shouting, Go, Perry. And they overheard the kids saying to him, good job, Perry. So now they weren't taunting us, but when their team went down the field, they were smiling at us going, go, Perry. Go, Perry. And we were doing this, and all of a sudden, it was kind of a model of ministry that I wanted to do, and I want to do everywhere we are, to find out we have so much more in common. And we divide over food and masks and Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter over holy days, so silly, so silly. Instead of putting ourselves, filling ourselves, not just to be Jesus-flavored, somebody told me, but Jesus-filled. And if we can do that, and we can live out these things and hold close to these words from Paul, writing to a church divided, and reminding them to focus on the central thing of the gospel and what really matters, and to have humility, knowing our own brokenness and that we've all fallen short, but hear the Lord's invitation to love one another and build one another up so that the church can do its true work and not be a vessel for more division, but an instrument of healing. Amen? Amen. That's my word to us to go out into a contentious week. Jesus had a contentious week, if you remember. And he took, he didn't go at the risk of his life, but the cost of his life. But before he did, he said to you and to us, Terry, if you can come up and Stewards can come up there and help us now. He took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is my cup, a new covenant. Go, I don't care if you, you know, trick or treat or hate trick or treat, it's all good. So long as you know, this is the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for everything that's broken in you and broken in your brother and sister. So as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so, please, please do, please do. do please, do, that we, we do this, like we're preparing now, all of us are preparing to come to this table to receive the bread and the cup, to be Jesus-filled, not just be Jesus-flavored. So you don't have to be a member of this church to come to this table. You don't have to be a baptized Christian. This is not a Garfield Memorial table. It's not a Methodist table. It's Jesus' table. So all of you have, Sundays, you know, we don't end our week Sundays. We start our week. You ever look at the calendar? So you're starting this week, whatever happens, you're starting it. These are your starting blocks at this table. Receive it, be filled, and let us go out and be instruments of healing in a broken world. Let's pray. God, let this bread and this cup be for us used. Come alive in us in new ways. Let us go into this week as aggressively and as joyfully as Sharon played that we might uh, be passionate witnesses for the real truth that what Paul would later say, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come as the ushers direct you. Thanks, guys.
Let's stand and sing number 614 as we close. First Corinthians 10, 10, 17 says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the same loaf. We have feasted at the table, we have shared the loaf together, and God has unified us. Let's, as our benediction, if you'll turn to your scripture, let's read the last verse, verse 19 together. So let's strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.